This happened two years ago, and I can't believe I still work there after this horrifying experience. Maggie and I and a few other employees were folding panties and organizing bras when a couple of women in their later 20s strolled in. They had a shady vibe about them that made me really nervous. They both were wearing sunglasses and it was uh, 8 o'clock at night, which seemed a little bit off to me. It was kind of like they didn't want to be noticed or identified. We work at Victoria's Secret, so we usually keep an eye out for thieves since our items were so expensive and valuable. One of the women who walked in looked to be about 8 months pregnant and was browsing through one of our panty tables when it appeared to us that she was stuffing items in her bag. Maggie and I walked closer to her without looking too obvious as we watched as she seemed to be sneaking panties in her shirt. That is when I realized that she was sticking them up in her belly. She was wearing a strap on her belly and lifted it up just enough to stick them in. It must have been hollowed out. As I went to find a manager, Maggie spoke in the headset that the girl was now going over to one of the bra sections and hiding behind a rack of clothes. That's when I heard it. Hey bitch, are you talking about me? You don't think I'm stealing, do you? Maggie froze in fear and assured her that she wasn't talking about her. The pregnant girl kept yelling about how we were racist against black people and how we just wanted to accuse her of stealing. My manager then walked over to calm the situation while calling security, just in case it got violent. Unfortunately, we constantly deal with customers stealing, which is a real nuisance, but we can't really confront them about it for safety reasons. We have to call the mall cops and then they call the real cops to come, which can take a while, and since the mall was closing soon, they just made them leave the mall instead of calling anyone. You might be wondering, why don't they search the ladies? Mall cops are different than real officers and are prohibited from searching anyone unless they actually see someone stealing themselves. So security came and escorted the pregnant lady and her friend to one of the exit doors and then came back to make sure that we were okay. We were fine and thought it was over, but we came to find that we were very wrong. Maggie and I were off at 9 so we clocked out and walked out of the store talking about how awkward that was and how clever but weird it was that she was wearing a fake belly. It's so scary and disturbing to find the lengths that people will go to to steal merchandise. That's when we heard, hey, that's them. Maggie and I looked behind us to see a pregnant lady and her friend with three big black guys. One of them is carrying a knife and they start sprinting at us. They yelled a bunch of profanity at us and threatening that they were going to make us sorry for what we did. Maggie and I start booking it as fast as we could to our cars which were parked close to each other while screaming in fear. Thankfully they were far enough away that we could get in our cars and drive off before they got to us. They definitely had a grudge against us for the store incident and they wanted to hurt us. While driving fast, I made sure I was not being followed since that group of people were extremely mad and crazy for wanting to potentially kill us over some stolen underwear. We told security the next day and our manager and security reviewed the cameras but couldn't identify them unfortunately. Now every time I leave work, I leave with multiple people and check the whole area before walking to my car. I also now own Mace. Since this event, we have remodeled our store and installed cameras so if we suspect them of stealing, we can look on the cameras and if the camera captures it, we can keep them in our store until the real cops come and arrest them. In 2008, I worked at a retail clothing store with my girlfriend Chelsea. We were both 18 years old and we tried to work as many shifts together as possible to maximize our time together because she was still in school. My grandfather had recently purchased a Dodge Sprinter van for his business and my car was being serviced overnight so I got to drive the van. Chelsea and I loved the nights when we got to take the van because it usually had back seats installed and the tinted windows meant that we could have some privacy which is great for teens who still live at home. That night we only had one row of seats in the back and it was the row just behind the driver and passenger. Chelsea and I parked near each other like we always did and worked our evening shift closing the store with a few other co-workers. We all left together and I helped the manager lock up because the glass door needed to be aligned properly for the lock to engage. It's early March in Pennsylvania and it's still very cold outside, so Chelsea usually starts her car to warm it up and sits with me as my car warms up as well. When I get to the vehicles, her car is idling and she's already in the van. I don't realize that I still have the keys and I never unlock the doors. She sits with me chatting for a while and she sits on my lap and we kiss in the front seats and we decide it's a little too late and too cold to have a little fun in the back. Every night we drive home separately from work while talking on the phone. She usually gets home first and I stay on the line while she just walks up her long driveway in the dark. 
That night I made it home first, for some reason, and I knew I had a lot of stuff to carry in, so when I'm close to the home, I tell her I'll call her back in a little while. She asked me to stay online because she was almost home and doesn't like walking past the dark brushes in her driveway. I stay on the phone and fumble with all my things I've been carrying out of the van. I know I locked in arm the van, because as I was using the key fob to lock the vehicle, I dropped a few things while struggling to keep the phone in my ear. The motion lights have illuminated the whole area, so I was able to see everything that I dropped. We both make it inside safely, and we also decide not to stay on the phone because she had school in the morning. I began to doze off almost immediately in my bedroom. I lived with my grandparents who built a house to accommodate my grandfather's aging parents suffering from Alzheimer's. My great-grandparents, so they didn't have to go in a home. The driveway runs parallel to a daylight basement that has two garage doors, an entrance door, and the French doors to my bedroom. I'm falling asleep as all the motion lights finally turn off and now my room is completely dark. It wasn't 20 minutes later when I was jarred awake by the alarm sirens of the van. All of the motion lights are on and the flashlight lights on the van alarm are filling in my room. I left the key upstairs in the main part of the house so I ran upstairs to silence the alarm. In the kitchen as I was grabbing the key, my grandfather, my great grandmother and I all meet in the dark. My grandfather grunts as he sees me grabbing the key but my granny said something that sent shivers down my spine. What in the Sam Hill are you doing running around outside at this time of night? I wasn't outside. I explained that I was sleeping, and she insisted that I was outside making the van alarm go off. My great-grandparents' bedroom sits above the garage doors looking down on the driveway and the van. I'm assuming she's confused. She has Alzheimer's after all. The goosebumps from her exclamation prompted me to grab a knife from the butcher block anyway and my grandfather followed me with the baseball bat. We both walked outside warily in our boxers, in the cold but highly illuminated dead of the night. The van is still going crazy. The interior lights were all flashing, and I remember that specifically because I'd never seen a car alarm do that. We silenced the alarm and started looking around. My grandfather said that he thought a deer may have run out of the woods and hit the van. I didn't say anything as we investigated. When I reached the back of the van, I noticed that the door was wide open. That explained the alarm. The van has a feature that if the alarm vehicle is armed and the door is open somehow from the outside or inside, it goes off. But how? I locked it and armed it, hence the blaring alarm. That's when I realized the door was open from the inside. My blood ran cold. The door was open, so the inside lights are still on. I see the empty space behind the row of seats and... There were wadded up napkins in a chip bag. Those weren't ours. Someone was in the car with me the entire time. I must have left the van unlocked by mistake when I went into work. And that's how Chelsea was able to get into the van without the keys at the end of the night. Was it a homeless person? Escaping the cold? Or someone with more sinister intent? What if I had gotten off my phone like I wanted to? If they had ill intent, the fact that I was on my phone might have saved my life. Because Chelsea would have raised hell if she heard me being attacked. I get the chills every time I think about it. We didn't call the police because my grandfather was skeptical of my conclusion, but my gut tells me that I didn't drive home alone that night. Person in the back of my van? Let's not meet. This happened last year, and I've been mentally scarred and taken to therapy, and now I feel like I can share me and my brother's story. I now live in Fulford, and this is something that has changed me completely. I was in year 10 at the time in high school, and I had my first period of the day which was history. My older brother had PE first and had a shaky history. He was caught for underage drinking and was caught shoplifting, and has been in shady groups. He has tried to straighten out his life, and does go to a party every now and again. He went to warm up for PE alone in the gym, and seemed to collapse. He went into cardiac arrest and the nurse and teachers did what process a CPR they knew as he had stopped breathing. He was alright, but was still in the hospital for a week, with no memory of what had happened until way after. He was very sporty about the whole thing, and it was very unusual. I later found out that the night before, he had been in a heated argument with a few friends. He then thought it was over and that they were buds since the guy had offered him a drink of full of water with powder. The guy said it was ginger fizz, so he smelled it to find the scent of ginger and drank it. He said immediately after he had felt extremely drunk. 
I decided to be a tough cookie and confront the guy of drugging my brother. The man was muscular and was twice my size despite him being only a year older, but I was too overcome by anger to be scared by him. He took it badly and started to swear at me and then accused me of being a racist, and I immediately stormed off. He then continued to threaten and harass me for two months, and thankfully, my brother had recovered and left the gang, but unfortunately, he had no idea of what was happening. I continued to get messages from this guy and eventually got help after four months. Skipped six months later, and he was off the radar and was long forgotten. Then one night, I had the feeling that I was being watched. I looked around to find the guy outside my window with a creepy smile and duct tape in one hand and a butcher's knife in the other. I freaked the fuck out and sprinted out the back door and made sure it was locked and did the same for the front door. I was home alone and heard him yelling, do us all a favor and leave. Do it for your brother. I called 999 and he was arrested for trespassing and harassment. So creepy guy that drugged my brother and tried to kill me? Let's never meet again. This took place in 2002 when I was 17 years old. I'm the son of a journalist couple and an only child. At the time we lived in a house on the countryside, my mom would usually work from her home office but now and then drive into town and work from there. She worked for a magazine at the time, focused on fishing and hunting and outdoorsy stuff. My dad, however, was on the other side of the journalist spectrum, working for a large newspaper and known for digging up interesting stories on a regular basis. In autumn of 2002, a cop came to my school to warn us about the fact that a gang were recruiting young people in the area and told us not to go near the old quarry because that was supposedly where they liked to hang out. I didn't think much of it at the time, but over dinner that night, I told my parents and my dad. Smelling a story, he decided to do some digging. So he started to dive past the old quarry at odd hours, but never saw anything interesting. We started to think the police just wanted us not to hang out there because it was a dangerous place to be in general. Fast forward into spring during the winter, my mom was tired of being alone in the house all day and had bought a dog. A fun loving Rhodesian Ridgeback mix. She took that dog for long walks and one day ended up in the wood area behind the quarry. She saw a strange hole in the ground and later described it as grave-like. The next day she brought my dad to see it only to find it covered up again in a very grave-like manner. They decided to phone the police, risking that it was nothing and embarrassing themselves, but not calling it in would leave them sleepless. So you guessed it, they found a dead guy buried in a shallow grave. It was a member of another gang and my dad smelled a promising story and wrote an article about the gangs and found out about their usual businesses and criminal behaviors. One day he got a note saying something like, I know where your wife walks that dog, would be a shame if she fell into that hole, and your boy should be careful driving, accidents happen so easily on the road. This only infuriated my dad to write more. One day after school, I arrived home in the afternoon, I had my earphones plugged in listening to music and minding my own business, when I felt a hand on my shoulder. It was a firm grip, not the light tap you expect from someone just wanting your attention. I turned around and there was this guy. He had tattoos all over his face and a beard that would put Santa to shame. No doubt what kind of fellow he was, so to speak. And he said, Listen kid, I don't particularly like to destroy such young lives, but really got your dad to thank for this. He backed me up against the wall of the guest house and informed me that he would like to try and not fuck up my kneecaps since they are apparently difficult to heal. And told me that he was just going to mess me up enough to shut up my dad. At that point... I thought I was doomed. I couldn't describe the kind of fucking panic that flooded over me. He punched me in the solar plexus and naturally I collapsed on the ground with an indescribable kind of sound. He backed up, getting ready to continue, but was interrupted by another noise, something primal and clearly threatening. Rescue came in the shape of a very pissed off and sharp teeth Rhodesian Ridgeback. Turned out my mom had been out walking the dog in the area behind the house and heard the car pull up. She let go of the dog knowing that the Rhodesian will fight to death for its pack and phone the police. The dog never had to bite, the growl was enough to make the man excuse himself and leave. We moved shortly after. This wasn't a life threatening or dangerous experience but 
it still really creeps me out. So now I'm going to tell you about this, starting from the very beginning. The first time I moved out of my boarding house was two years ago. It was a nice place, with everything I needed. We have cable TV, water, heating, good internet connection, room service, and laundry for a very reasonable price. It's hard to find a place like this at the city. There are still some disadvantages from my boarding house, though. It's kind of far from my campus, and at night it's so dark because there's only one street light and it's seldom on. At first, I had no trouble walking alone through the alley. It's always full of people between 6am and 8pm. But in the middle of the first semester, I was starting to have a lot of things to do at my campus that needed me to stay out even more late. And one night, I walked through the alley, and at the corner of my eye, I saw a figure roaming on the street. There was no light, and I could only see that the figure was crook-backed, and I felt like it was staring right at me. I walked faster when I passed the figure, trying not to see that person's eyes. Not far from that, there was a couple making out on a shelter at the side of the street. Seeing that made me forget about the crook-backed figure, though several nights later, I came home late again. It was about 2am and I was really sleepy and almost fell asleep at the bus when I walked through the usual alley. The streetlight was on. There stood the crook-backed figure under the light. I saw her clearly that time. She was an old woman wearing clothes made of sewn banners. She wasn't really crooked, it's just that she didn't stand straight. She was staring at me. That time, I wasn't sure whether she was the same person or not, because as I said before, she wore banners. As she was just roaming around the alley without doing specific things, I passed her again. She didn't do anything weird, just stared at me the entire time. She continued to stare at me throughout the third and fourth time and so on. I met her almost every time I came home late and was getting used to her staring at me. She never did anything to me, so I didn't bother to do anything about it. And then, at a fine night when I actually didn't come home as late as usual, something happened. I passed her as usual, and suddenly she took my wrist from behind. Have you eaten yet? She asked me. I was shocked and confused for a moment. I answered yes, and she let go of my hand. And then without thinking, I walked really fast leaving her. But she ran after me. She took my arm again and asked me the same question. This time I yelled at her, YES, and trying to get her off my grip. She didn't want to let go of my hand though. I was thinking about pushing her away from me, but what I did was pinching her hand really hard. That way, she let go of my hand. Without wasting any moments, I ran away as fast as I could from her. Thankfully, she didn't follow me to my boarding house. If she did, I didn't know what I would have done to her. I might have assaulted her if she had tried to come back at me, but... My family lived very far away, and I didn't want to cause any trouble. After that, sometimes I met her again, but she never touched me again like she did that night. She was always just staring at me. Just staring at me.